Did you know that high-risk pulmonary embolism has a case fatality rate of up to 65% in patients experiencing cardiac arrest? Stay tuned as we delve into the world of this life-threatening condition, explore its diagnostic challenges, and reveal the cutting-edge treatment options that can make all the difference in saving lives. In acute PE, mechanical obstruction of pulmonary vasculature and vasoconstriction caused by the release of vasoactive mediators lead to a sudden increase in right ventricular RV, afterload. This results in RV muscle stretch, increased RV contractility due to neurohumeral activation, dilatation, and eventually failure. Reduced oxygen supply and inflammation of the RV further impair its contractility. Oxygen supply to the RV is limited in acute PE due to impaired coronary perfusion and hypoxia. A drop in systemic blood pressure worsens myocardial blood supply. Hypoxemia frequently occurs due to various factors such as overperfusion, atelectasis, and intracardiac shunting. Neurohumeral activation and the subsequent inflammatory response contribute to myocardial damage and dysfunction. Ventricular interdependence plays a crucial role in RV failure. Increased RV wall tension prolongs RV contraction time, causing a leftward shift of the interventricular septum, which compromises left ventricular filling and cardiac output. The progression of RV failure leads to a vicious circle, increasing oxygen demand and decreasing oxygen supply, ultimately resulting in hemodynamic instability and life-threatening tachyrrhythmias. Diagnosing high-risk pulmonary embolism, PE, in hemodynamically unstable or mechanically ventilated patients can be challenging, as standard diagnostic recommendations are not applicable in these cases. Transportation to CTPA may not be feasible for such patients. Echocardiography serves as an alternative diagnostic tool in this situation, detecting acute core pulmonale with PE-associated right ventricular, RV, pressure overload and septal dyskinesia. While echocardiography can help identify RV abnormalities, it doesn't have perfect specificity for diagnosing PE. In the ICU, new onset RV dilation in a patient in shock should raise suspicion for high-risk PE. The diagnosis can be confirmed using CTPA or other imaging tests. Supporting evidence such as a concurrent RV thrombus, deep vein thrombosis assessed by compression ultrasonography, or a dilated inferior vena cava demonstrating the presence of thrombus and increased pressure in the pulmonary artery can help confirm the diagnosis of PE. High-risk PE patients require immediate reperfusion therapy, followed by therapeutic anticoagulation using unfractionated heparin. International guidelines recommend standard-dose systemic thrombolysis, which is associated with rapid resolution of the thrombus and improved pulmonary artery pressures. However, it also carries a significant risk of major bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage. Some physicians may be hesitant to administer systemic thrombolysis due to these risks, potentially leading to poorer outcomes and higher mortality. Half-dose systemic thrombolysis has been proposed as an alternative with less bleeding risk, but it may result in higher rates of reperfusion failures and the need for secondary fibrinolysis and catheter-based interventions. Surgical embolectomy can be considered when fibrinolysis fails or is contraindicated, but its complexity and surgical risks make catheter-based approaches more attractive. Catheter-directed thrombolysis, catheter-based embolectomy devices, or a combination of both may reverse RV injury more rapidly than anticoagulation alone. However, their effectiveness compared to systemic thrombolysis remains unclear due to a lack of adequately powered studies in high-risk PE patients. Hemodynamic support for high-risk PE patients depends on the RV preload status. For patients without signs of increased right-sided preload, the goal is to increase RV preload with intravenous fluids. In patients with an already increased preload, the aim is to improve RV function using inotropes and vasopressors, such as norepinephrine, epinephrine, and vasopressin. Inotropes and vasopressors may also be necessary to enhance cardiac output or manage hemodynamic instability associated with significant tachycardia. Venoarterial extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, that is VAECMO, can provide effective circulatory support for patients with RV failure and obstructive shock, particularly for those unresponsive to treatment or with contraindications to thrombolysis. 
However, ECMO carries a significant bleeding risk, and a balanced anticoagulation strategy may be needed if lysis is absolutely contraindicated. While VAECMO can restore hemodynamic stability, provide adequate gas exchange, and support the RV, no randomized controlled trials have assessed its efficacy and safety in high-risk PE. ECMO might also induce adverse effects, such as reduced bronchial arterial blood flow, decreased pulmonary blood flow, transpulmonary gradient, and worsening lung ischemia. Small observational studies have reported varying results regarding the potential benefits of using ECMO with or without reperfusion. One study reported a 30% mortality rate for high-risk PE patients receiving ECMO and surgical embolectomy, while those receiving other management strategies had a worse prognosis. A stepwise algorithm combining both strategies may be promising, but additional studies are needed before incorporating it into clinical practice. Current guidelines emphasize that VAECMO should only be considered in combination with alternative reperfusion strategies in patients with PE and refractory circulatory collapse or cardiac arrest. High-risk PE is a complex and critical condition. By understanding its mechanisms and staying updated on diagnostic and treatment options, you can make a difference in managing this life-threatening condition. Keep learning, and help save lives in the battle against high-risk pulmonary embolism.